Jet lag never gets any easier, does it? What's your secret, Bill? A secret. Secret for jet lag. You flatter me, Richard. <laughs> We're talking about the next model for global banking. Uh, Bernard, the Americans would say Bernard. I say Bernard. Bernie's good. Bernie. <laughs> uh, Bernie means uh, the president of the Inter of International Bank of America. And Bill Winters is the group CEO of Standard Chartered. The title is the next model for global banking. Um, but before we talk about the next model, let's, ex let's just, just pause and think, what's the existing strength and resilience of the banking sector? Bearing in mind what we saw last year uh, with SVB, et cetera, et cetera. Um, is that all gone and passed? I think there's, there's lessons to be learned, obviously, from the, from the problems with the regional banks, and then obviously we had the big uh, demise of, of Credit Suisse. Uh, those to me are good old-fashioned banking problems. You had assets and liabilities that were mismatched. Uh, there was a, a, a confidence shock for different reasons. For, I think for each of the banks that failed, there was a different reason. But a confidence shock with an asset liability mismatch leads to a challenge. And uh, I think the uh, central banks of the world responded to that challenge in a macro sense, extremely well, because they, they stopped the rot. Uh, Do, would the rot have extended if they had not moved so fast? I mean, the, the, the issue with the mispricing of bonds and uh, the risk asset management could have, become, could have had contagious effects. Uh, absolutely could have. You know, we'll never know for sure, because the central banks did the right thing. And they, they protected the, the depositors. They, they, very clear signals that the depositors were protected very structural programs in the US, and then they've effectively encircled the banks, and they've been working the banks that weren't going to make it out of the system through acquisition uh, or otherwise. Uh, but, uh, but there's lessons in there, because when you have a, a, an asset liability mismatch or, or a credit concentration, and you have an exogenous shock, bad things happen in banking. We have to learn that lesson. So no, it's not the same. All right, bad things happen in banking. But were you surprised, Bernie, at the at the complete failure of risk management in those institutions? Well, I think um, Silicon Valley goes slightly different to Credit Suisse. I think Credit Suisse had perhaps a bit of a business model issue as well. I was a little bit surprised that people hadn't focused on the fact that if interest rates are 5% versus 1%, you've really you know, got to be paying attention. So that, that was a bit of a surprise. Also surprising was the speed of the move. I, I'm not fully bought into the, yet the fact that you know, we're in an internet age and therefore deposits can move very fast. I suspect that's the case, but the transmission mechanism in terms of deposits moving. Um, and, and I think one of the things that is, that one of the lessons learned, as Bill is saying, is looking at the, <clears throat> the stickiness, the, you know, the, 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 your, the liability side of the balance sheet and how that's constituted. The, the, this aspect of the speed of deposits, you know, the, 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 the reality of internet banking, um, app banking, Erica, for, for Bank of America. Um, does that, is that, um, have we harnessed that fully yet, Bill? Well, harness sounds like a good thing. Uh, <laughs> I think you, you started the question suggesting it was a threat, and it is. I mean, it makes it easier to... Yeah, but we've got around. no choice. It's where we're going. It's, it's, it's definitely where we're going. But look, I, I, like many of us in this room, uh, was around, you know, watching my screen when the queues formed in front of Northern Rock Bank in 2007. Uh, on a Friday afternoon and on Saturday, the bank was gone. So we like to say, oh, you know, in the internet era, everything's going so much faster. But as soon as you have a lack of confidence, the queues form. In that case, it was physical queues, people trying to get their cash out. Now it's, you know, zap, zap on the app. So maybe it's a, it's a half a day faster. But it doesn't matter. If you lose confidence, you lose confidence. And, and it's absolutely key for bank management, and Bernie and I both fight this every day, uh, and for bank regulators, to make sure that confidence is never questioned in the banking system while letting individual banks fail if they have faulty business models or make egregious mistakes. Now that's a shift, in a sense, because it creates a greater priority for the reputational aspect, as opposed to... The reality is you can no longer manage the run on the bank, because it will happen before you've realized it. I think, I think also the backdrop, let's not forget, is that the, the interest rate environment changed. And a lot of us always said, when you get through this massive quantitative easing and you get through quantitative tightening, things are going to go pop. And I'd say Silicon Valley Bank was one, Credit Suisse was another. In fact, what the UK government went through also was something else. So 
I, I think, and, and there might be other things that might happen. So insofar as interest rates have moved in, in this different paradigm, we just need to be that much more alert. The risks, I, I'm aware of the, the nature of this conference, if you will, but we, we're, not in, we're not sailing in splendid isolation. The reality is there are two wars going on at the moment. One in Europe and one in the Middle East that's threatening to get a great deal worse in the next few days. From your point of view, accepting before you, I mean, and feel free to call you know, the humanitarian aspects of this, which are obviously a primacy. What are you watching? What are you, from your professional point of view, what are you concerned about? Yeah, I mean, my, my first observation is there are two horrific wars going on right now, and we're watching them fold out, uh, unfold live, and, and they're awful. I'm, you know, utmost sympathy for all those affected. There's also a war in the Sahel, there's a war in northern Nigeria, there's a war in Libya, there's a war in Syria, there's a war in Korea. Uh, I mean, it could go on and on. There's been war, and these wars have been going on for years and years. Millions of displaced people, absolute poverty and misery. So the, the global economy is resilient to things that, that don't affect a few basics. Interest rates, commodity prices, or abil people's ability to travel. And right now, these wars are contained. And then they, I, we can only hope that they are resolved if not resolved, then at least contained. Uh, in that case, the much more pressing concerns are the economy, interest rates, inflation, and, and, and the things that are affecting the business decisions from day to day. Right, but you can't have, I mean, to, to, the omnipresent and omnipowerful banker can't control what will happen with the war, but you can, you can direct your strategies and your focus as necessary. Now, in BOA International, how are you accommodating what needs to be Achieved. Yeah. Well, I mean, they're the very specific tactical issues. And as Bill said, I mean, we had staff in Russia, as everybody else did, and we had to spend time, and, and families have been massively impacted. And we're seeing them in the Middle East right now, and, and our communities, not just in the Middle East and, and elsewhere. So, very tactically, you're managing through that, uh, and there's other geopolitical situations that have to be managed as well. I think that on a more strategic level, um, look, our job fundamentally is to gather those with excess savings with those that need it at the end of the day. Banks gather these and then we give it to whether it's to corporates or to individuals. That gets a little bit tougher when interest rates are higher. When interest rates were free, when, when money was free, you could operate in, in, in one way versus the other. And then I think as the world gets a little bit more fragmented, I'd like to cling on to the fact that globalization is still there. Maybe it's peaked, but I wouldn't say it's in full retreat you have to be a lot more thoughtful about how you, how you gather those assets, you know, who you lend to, the regulatory hurdles that you have to go through to sort of you know, make that work. But you're having to do that to bring back to what the next generation. You're having to make those more complex decisions in a faster environment because of AI and because you know, your client will go elsewhere. He's waiting to take your client and vice versa. It, it's, okay, it's a lot more complex. By the way, when we went through 2008 and 9, the regulatory rules that came in were multiples more complex. And, and, and I would say there were some institutions, because interest rates then went very low and stayed low, they probably didn't really adjust, adjust to the fact that the capital and the liquidity regimes had changed. So, so that has happened. The geopolitics is more. There's, we have, we're in 30, 40 countries. We have 50 maybe regulators, probably a sim similar amount. Each regulator wants more of their own thing. Even in, in Saudi, which is terrific, Saudi Arabia is very focused on developing its own capital formation, quite rightly. So I, I, I often say that if you're a CEO of a bank 10 years ago, you sort of thought of London, Hong Kong, and New York. Now you have to think London, Paris, New York, Singapore, Hong Kong, maybe Riyadh, Dubai. So it's, it's, it's more complex than that. You'd have, thought, does this, you'd have thought the US banks would be better at multiple regulatory systems, having got 50 <laughs> we got, states. We got a few, we got a few back up. You know, you'd have thought that you'd have got quite used to that now when you then go overseas. And I think, I think that it means that there are fewer institutions that can truly operate globally. And, and I think that, look, I think that pays for our strengths. And a few global financial institutions that can bring the resources to bear, that can operate across different jurisdictions and deal with the massive regulatory and compliance burdens. I'm not sure if that's a good thing or not, but I certainly, it fits our model. If we are higher for longer, what's the implications, Bill? Higher for longer almost certainly means a stronger dollar for longer as well. And that, that combination of, of higher interest rates and a stronger dollar is very tough for any non-US company that has borrowed in US dollars or country. So, now, we've seen a few countries restructure already. There are a few more that, are, that have been fighting it off very bravely. 
but the pressure mounts as, as time goes by. So I think that's the first one. But it's also, I mean, the reason interest rates are high is because the, the Fed is trying to, to depress economic activity in order to bring inflation down. So inevitably, we're going to have a slower economic outturn in the U.S. Let's just hope, and I think there's a reasonable case to be made, that China will be re-emerging at that point as a growth engine. It already is. Uh, to offset with some of the inevitable slowness in the U.S. and Europe. But that's uh, higher for longer, certainly means pressures. Do you think we are about to see the Fed fudge? Well, we'll get to 2% over the period, over the, you know, the, the next two years. Mohammed al Arian says it, you know, it'll be 2025 before you get anywhere near that. So I, I think if the Fed will be 100% committed to 2% until the very moment that they're not. <laughs> How's that for an answer? It, I, I think impressive, very, impressive. It's going to be very hard to get to 2%, and I think it'll be very... The tough. last mile. The last mile will be very tough, and, and there will be a very reasonable debate about whether it's necessary. Do you think it's worth the last mile, or do you fudge and say, ah, two and a half over the asymmetric period? You have to look at the cost. I mean, what, what's, what's, in order to get from two and a half to two, what's going to have to happen? Do you have to generate a recession? It may not be worthwhile. Do you have to have an extra year of, of 1.5% growth rather than 2% growth? No problem. Right? That's, I think that's the... You can't judge it ex ante. You've got to take a look at the facts on the ground, which I'm sure is what, is what the Fed does. Okay, and and uh, uh, lying behind that is what, what gives us sort of the economic anchors, as it were. What, what gives us the monetary anchors? So you move from the gold regime, then you had a period where the central banks were all-powerful. The bond markets were to some extent, and the central banks had a huge amount of credibility. So the idea of moving from 2% is non-trivial. You know, how do you move from there? Do they, are they able to move from that with credibility? Do they stay there? And what's the cost of that? So it's, I think it's a non-trivial debate that will happen probably behind the scenes. But those that might call for that shift need to be thoughtful about it. Because if it's unanchored and central banks don't have that, that sort of credibility, then we all need to look around for what else provides that inflation anchor. You know, that's, that's the reason why some people are in crypto, because they say, well, governments have been printing money, and, and therefore it's going to be debased in some shape or form. So they might seem like archaic, you know, theoretical economic discussions, but they really matter. Yep. What will be... I mean, there's an entire generation of, of people who are now learning that interest rates are not zero or 1%. Uh, those in this room will remember, because none of us are that young, um, interest rates, well, double digits. Um, is, the, is the environment that we're in risky or conducive to investment? Um, well, the transition makes it a, a little riskier in the, in the definition of there's a wider range of outcomes, which is sort of the traditional definition. So I think as we're transitioning through to where we need to be, um, uh, it is that little bit more uncertain. Um, I think that the paradigm, the sort of the globalization paradigm that reduced sort of input costs and, and, and all, all, all of them, the supply chains to the sort of points of maximum efficiency, if we're shifting away from that, um, again, that might lead to an underlying different sort of rate of inflation trend, and we need to, we need to figure that out. So it feels as if we are in a transition. I'm, I'm hoping we're just... There are a lot of central bankers that believe that we're just in this transitionary period, we'll be back to 2%. Let's hope so. If not, we'll have to. How do you... Okay. No, I think it's very conducive to investment, but it's not for the faint-hearted. So uh, you, you've reported and you've seen lots and lots of stories about the, the tremendous growth of the private credit business. And those are smart people who are saying, yeah, we're, we're going to get close to the bottom at some point, and I want to die at that point. Now, are, we, is, are we there today, or do we have to wait three months or six months? It's not five years. So... I, I think this is... Right. Uh, people are gearing up to invest. So, ah, you think people are gearing up to invest? In financial markets, I think people are investing right here, right now. Right. So, I did a cleaning up operation last week. I went into my portfolio, which is small before anybody asks, <laughs> and I got rid of stocks that I wish I'd got rid of 18 months ago but we're now showing losses of 80, 90% beyond meat and the like, and we're not coming back anytime soon. Is the environment right to go back in now? Ah, uh, you'd have to pay me a small fee to give you investment advice. <laughs> that can be arranged. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm getting... Do, oh, do you take Zelle or do you take Venmo? <laughs> Zelle would be good, thank you very much. Um, look, I, I think as Bill said, he, he is right in the sense that um, 
a lot of people over time have made a lot of money by being contrarian investors, right? You shouldn't be contrarian for the sake of it, but you could take a view that actually things are dislocated. You know, treasuries are down 25%, Bitcoin is up whatever percent in this period of time. So you can take that view. I mean, there's always obviously a portfolio approach in terms of, you know, where you touch yourself. And a lot of people sort of think, well, actually 5% in cash is great for me right now. I don't need to reach out. There's no duration to that. So it's, it's really your, your risk appetite and, and investment horizon. But I think there are tremendous opportunities. It depends if you're marked to marketing right. every day or not. So as we come to the end, how important am I as the consumer banker? You know, we've talked about Zelle and the way in which money is transferred. Venmo, Wise, all the, uh, Monzo in the UK, uh, M-Pesa in Africa, which is just sensational. Do these, they don't worry you, but they have to again be managed to, make, to keep you relevant. No, they do, and I, I think I, I know it's the same at Bank of America. There's really two distinct retail banking client segments. There's the more affluent, uh, who really need advice. Sometimes they need a big mortgage, and, and they want to make sure that their transaction life is very simple. And then there's the mass market that wants convenience and needs to borrow money from time to time you know, to buy a phone or to, 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 buy a, uh, to pay school fees. That first part, that first group are expensive for you because they require a certain amount of individuality. That second lot, you can shove with AI and technology. Well, the, the, the first is expensive, but it's also very profitable uh, because people will pay for good advice. That's been our experience across Asia, Middle East, and Africa. Uh, people pay for good advice, and it's, it's the highest returning business that we have in the bank. Uh, the mass market, it's got to be highly efficient and perfectly convenient. And, uh, and if you do that right, and you can get scale, that's also a profitable business. It, but the challenge of getting it right because with millions, how many, how many accounts, uh, BOA? So, look, we have 65, close to 70 million customers. I'd say maybe 20, 25 million are mass affluent. And, and, and Bill is absolutely right. The way we look at it, actually, we run them as two separate lines of businesses. And one, we run on a cost metric. We want to run it as efficiently as possible. We want to have automation. And, and the, the reason, and AI and machine learning, we've had that, as you mentioned with Erica, the only way we've been able to take on 100, 100, a couple of hundred thousand, sometimes a month, every two months, is because of the automation. And you run it to make sure you can run it as efficiently, as cheaply as possible. So you're not charging overdraft fees. You're not charging for cards. And when people are calling, you're able to service them. We've changed our branch models, gone from 6,000 branches to 4,000, but serving millions more customers. So that's one segment. And then as Bill says, your mass affluence is a profitable segment. You can apply technology to them, and then you can migrate them up if you have the model we have to wealth management, et cetera. Ultimately, though, as you plan your strategies for your banks, I mean, I am sort of the dinosaur in a sense of, yes, I may be at the higher end earning level, but I still want a branch and a bank manager I can go and talk to. Um, but anybody under 30 would look at me as if to say, you're barking mad. Do it on the app. When was the last time you went into a branch, Richard? <laughs> so this is the point. Because you've closed them all. <laughs> no, but this is Jamie's the closed all the branches. <laughs> you, you, you want to know that the branch is there. Yes. But you're never going to visit it. So we just put up a, like a picture <coughs> of a branch. <laughs> and we see how many people go to touch the doorknob. The answer is approximately zero. No, that's not true. We, I mean, you have thousands of branches. We have hundreds of branches. And uh, more and more you'll see branches become places where people drop in to get advice. And less and less you'll see that branches are places where people to do transactions. Final question. We're out of time. One thing you want to change in banking, in your bank in the next 12 months? I, I think technology is huge and it's great. I'm passionate about that. And I'd like us to, I think we adopted incredibly well. I'd like us to increase the speed of adoption because I think there's things that, that can help global capitals flow and retail and all of that. But it's hard because we're regulated. We've got to make sure that from a cyber basis we don't get you know, attacked, etc. But that's something I'd like to do. I thought you were going to say open more branches for me. Go on. <laughs> I, 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 12 months from now, I'd like it to be clear in the minds of our customers and investors that the idea that there are fintechs and then there are banks is a, is a false dichotomy that we're, we're really doing the same thing. And banks can do fintech stuff very well. Fintechs can innovate extremely well. More often than not, we work together. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us, Bill Winters and Bernie. <laughs>